Hi, I'm Cory Doctorow, and this talk I'm about to give you, it's based on a paper that has the same name as this talk, Privacy Without Monopoly. I co-wrote it with my EFF colleague, Bennett Ciphers. You can find it at EFF.org slash PWM. Now, anytime somebody brings up big tech and the monopolization of the internet, you're bound to hear about network effects. Network effects are when a product gets better because more people are using it. So think about Facebook. The fact that your friends are already on Facebook is a good reason for you to join so you can hang out with them. And once you join Facebook, well, you become a reason for someone else to join so they can hang out with you. Or think of the iPhone. Every time someone makes an iPhone app, well, that's a reason to buy an iPhone. And every time that somebody buys an iPhone, well, that's a customer for your iPhone app. Now, network effects are important, but they're only half the story. Network effects are how tech companies get big. Because once a tech company achieves a critical mass, network effects mean that they keep growing. But network effects aren't why tech companies stay big. To understand why tech companies stay big, you have to think about something more important. You have to think about switching costs. A switching cost is the name for what you have to give up when you want to leave a product or a service behind. And tech platforms have really high switching costs. So think about what it costs you to leave Facebook behind, abandoning the communities that you belong to, the friends and family that you communicate with, even your customers. Or think of what it means to leave Google and losing your search and even maybe your mobile platform, or what it means to leave iOS behind and getting rid of all of the apps that you've bought and the data that you've created with them. Now, those switching costs, they didn't occur by accident. Tech companies engineered them into the system. After all, if you can switch mobile providers without losing touch with your friends, without even having to change your phone number, there's not really any technical reason why Facebook couldn't be designed so that you can leave Facebook and still hang out with your friends who stayed behind. Facebook spent millions of dollars and conducted endless research to make it possible for you to find your friends and hang out with them when you join Facebook. For example, think of the endlessly inventing and deceptive engineering that goes into convincing you to import your address book when you join Facebook. But not only have they failed to produce tools that let you stay in touch with your friends when you leave Facebook, they've actually devoted a lot of engineering dollars to blocking you from maintaining your relationships after you quit being their user. In other words, Facebook, all the tech monopolists, do everything they can to raise the switching costs for users who switch to a rival. Why do companies like high switching costs? Well, companies need to balance their interests with your interests. Sometimes you and a company might have the same interests, like you want your phone to operate without ever crashing, and the people who sold you your phone don't want it to crash either. But sometimes you don't have the same interests as the company and its shareholders. Sometimes what's best for you isn't what's best for the company. And when that happens, companies would really like it if that dispute was resolved in their favor. But when companies do something that redounds to their benefit and not to yours, like gouging you on price or sucking up your personal information, there's a risk, right? The risk is that you might quit the service and go somewhere else. And that's where switching costs come in. The higher the switching cost is, the more a company can abuse you before it makes sense for you to stop being their customer. That is, if preserving your privacy costs less than the cost of losing touch with your Facebook friends, the communities and the customers that you have there, then Facebook can abuse your privacy without losing you as a customer. The more you stand to lose by quitting a product or a service, the more value the company that provides that product or service can transfer from your side of the balance sheet to their side of the balance sheet without risking you walking away and no longer being their customer. Now, Fortunately for the internet connected world, the general purpose computer running on a general purpose network can eat switching costs for breakfast. Reverse engineering, scraping, encapsulation, compatibility layers, quirks modes, virtualization, they're all fancy names for the same thing. They're all ways to talk about connecting something new to something that already exists. In other words, these are all tools for interoperability. Interoperability 
is a profound and crucial part of the design and operation of a technological society. All other things being equal, interoperability puts a limit on how badly a company can abuse its customers. For example, think about what Apple did to Microsoft at the turn of this millennium. The Office programs that Microsoft made for the Mac were terrible. So much so that workplaces began to transition everyone, even the graphic designers who loved their Macs, to Windows so that they could communicate with the rest of the team. Now, Microsoft had a network effect on its side. Every Microsoft document that anyone created anywhere in the world using Windows made Windows more valuable. That was the network effect. And not using Windows meant that you were cut off from all those Microsoft Office docs. That was the switching costs. So Apple lowered the switching cost to undo the network effect. They made a thing called the iWork suite, three programs called Pages, Numbers, and Keynote, by reverse engineering Microsoft's file formats and making interoperable products that could read and write the files that Windows users were creating. After that, the cost of switching went to zero. Network effects are how companies get big, but switching costs are how they stay big. Which is why companies have done everything they can to raise switching costs. Both through technological countermeasures, like they put DRM on their products, they obfuscate their code, they add tamper resistance to their hardware, but more importantly, through legal countermeasures. Uh, laws like the American Section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act that makes it a crime to break DRM, or the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which was used to threaten people who violated terms of service with prison time or software patents, or weird contractual theories like tortious interference, and more. There's a whole zoo of these weird lawyerly theories about why you shouldn't be allowed to make the technology that you use work for you instead of the company that made it. And those legal theories and those technical countermeasures are how big tech stays big. And the higher the switching costs, the more big tech can abuse you. Because the higher the switching costs, the worse that abuse has to be before it makes sense for you to switch. Which brings us to privacy. Companies don't invade your privacy because they're nosy. <laughs> they spy on you because they think it'll make them more profitable. Google and Facebook invade your privacy to increase the value of their ad targeting business. And Apple invades its Chinese users' privacy by backdooring its cloud service and blocking working VPNs from its app stores to preserve its access to Chinese manufacturing and Chinese customers. Now, interoperability lowers switching costs. That makes it easier to switch away from a company whose products invade your privacy, which means that companies are less likely to invade your privacy. And if they do, you get to switch. Which is why we've seen legal interoperability mandates proposed in the United Kingdom, in the United States, in the European Union, and elsewhere. These bills and regulations propose three kinds of interoperability. The first is data portability. This is the simplest one. This is the right to download a snapshot of your data in some standard format, either to use as your own reference on your own hard drive or to upload to a new service that you want to move to. The second one is much more sophisticated. It's back-end interoperability. Backend interoperability is when a company is forced to expose an API so that new services can exchange data with the ones that already exist. So like you could stand up a Mastodon instance and plug it into Facebook and communicate with your friends on Facebook, but not be spied on by Facebook or advertised to by Facebook, not have to put up with their crummy uh, moderation policies and generally liberate yourself from the evil dictatorship of Mark Zuckerberg. The third kind is delegatability. That's interoperability on the front end. That's when the services user interface gets scriptable, so users can delegate a third party to operate the service on their behalf, which sounds very abstract, but like take Facebook's um, interface or Google's interface for their privacy settings. Google has a, a crazily complicated way of setting your privacy settings up. In fact, the, the people who run their location services can't find all the places where you have to turn off don't track my location successfully and if you miss just one of those tick boxes 
uh, Google will follow you around everywhere you go and make a record of it and, you know, give that information to the police and use that to figure out how to sell you stuff and so on. It's incredibly invasive. So imagine that you ask Privacy International to navigate through that huge number of Google setting screens and uh, adjust them so that uh, location tracking is turned off on all of them. That's delegatability. You delegate Privacy International to kind of run a script on your Google account, find all the places where you have to tick a box and liberate you from being followed around wherever you go in the real world. Now, all of this sounds great, but it's all got a complicated relationship to privacy. Now, on the one hand, interoperability promises to allow users to reclaim their privacy. Like, if you're stuck on a high surveillance service, you can switch to a privacy-respecting rival, including the kinds of services that we haven't had since the glory days of the internet. Cooperatives, nonprofits, public services. And you can do that without having to sacrifice your relationships and the benefits that you get for interacting with those dominant platforms. You can stay in touch with your friends, your family, your customers, the people who matter to you. And interoperability also puts pressure on those big companies to be better on privacy because if the switching costs are low, it means that the choices that put their shareholders' interests over their users' interests will result in users switching, which will cost them money, which is ultimately the only thing they give a damn about. But on the other hand, interoperability could be a privacy nightmare. What if privacy abusing services also plug into those dominant platforms? Like at the hearings on the Access Act, which is one of these interoperability bills here in the United States, there were um, uh, Congress people who said, well, what happens if the Chinese government wants to interact with Facebook? What happens if a successor to Cambridge Analytica wants to plug into Facebook? And if they uh, want to spy on users using these interoperability mandates? And these are good questions, but the answer that the platforms come up to, come up with to answer these questions, that answer is really stupid. Companies like Facebook and Google and Apple say that they're already doing all that anyone could ever want on privacy, that they've already perfectly balanced user privacy and user freedom, and that they have the same interests as their users. And the best way to ensure that no bad guys get to plug into their systems is to put them in charge, to give them free reign, to block interoperability whenever they think that someone who wants to plug in isn't good for their users. Now, whenever the fox starts to tell you how good they are guarding the hen house, you should be suspicious. So when Facebook tells us that we can trust it not to let scumbags like Cambridge Analytica to access our data, we should not believe them. Why? <laughs> well, Facebook already let Cambridge Analytica access our data. Every platform from Google to Apple to LinkedIn to Microsoft has either intentionally allowed bad guys to suck data out of their networks or has screwed up security so badly that it happened anyway. Monopolists cannot be dis trusted to decide who gets to compete with them. I mean, obviously. And yeah, I know, I said Microsoft and LinkedIn as though they were two different companies when they're just one company. That's right, all of these companies are turning into just one company, which is why it's silly to think that there's a difference between them. They're all really the same. But of course, there are actual privacy risks to interoperability, and proposals to improve interoperability should, and do, address that privacy risk. In an ideal world, every country would have a strong national data protection law, a law that specifies when consent is needed uh, and how it should be obtained for accessing our information, describing what real consent is, like it's not consent if you just click I agree on some sprawling garbage novella of impenetrable legalese that no one has ever read and no one will ever read because we all know that it says that by being stupid enough to trust Mark Zuckerberg or Tim Cook or Sundar Pinchai or any other of these tech bosses, you agree that they're allowed to come over to your house and punch your grandmother and wear your underwear, make long distance calls and eat all the food in your fridge. A good privacy law would clarify the hard problems like do you need your friend's permission to take the private messages that they sent you with, with you when you leave the platform? Can you take your DMs with you or do they own the DMs? Now in the European Union, they actually have one of these national strong privacy laws, a regional strong privacy law, the General Data Protection Regulation or GDPR. Now the GDPR, it's a mixed bag. 
It gets a bad rap, but even with its flaws, it is a democratically arrived upon set of rules for data processing. And if those rules have flaws, we have a democratic pathway for fixing them, which is far better than not having any rules. And it's far better than having what rules we have set unilaterally by monopolists with conflicted priorities and terrible privacy track records. A good national privacy law shouldn't just spell out the rules for obtaining consent. It also must have a private right of action. That means that when your rights are violated, you get to sue for compensation rather than uh, contacting a local attorney general or district attorney or other government official and hoping that they'll think that your case is important enough to take up. With a national privacy law and a private right of action, a lot of the hardest problems with interoperability mandates go away, like the question of whether you can take your friend's annotations to your photos with you if you export them to a new service, or whether your address book belongs to you or belongs to Google, as well as some really hard questions like, even if you need someone's consent to port their messages over to a new service, who does that apply to? Like, if someone harasses and stalks you and you save their message in case you need to get a restraining order, does that person get to decide whether or not you can keep those messages when you leave Facebook, who failed to stop them from stalking and harassing you, and go somewhere else? When governments order companies to interoperate, they can add more layers of privacy protection beyond any statutory rules. So like in the first version of the Access Act that was introduced in the Senate in 2020, it directed the regulator, the Federal Trade Commission, to create a new class of licensed intermediaries, companies that would review applications from companies that wanted to plug into Facebook and the other big firms' APIs. These third parties would be strictly regulated. They'd be prohibited from competing with either the tech giants or the other new companies they oversaw, and they'd be in charge of weeding out potential bad actors uh, and deciding what a reasonable cost discovery basis was for using the APIs and putting load on the dominant platform servers. The Access Act was reintroduced in 2021 and gets rid of these intermediaries, but it replaces them with rules for the new companies that plug into the mandatory APIs. Rules like you're not ever allowed to monetize or share user data at all, ever, period. Interoperability mandates have their place. They were key to ensuring competition and superior service in long distance telephones, for example, which is how we got the first big BBS bloom. But there's another kind of interoperability, my favorite kind of interoperability. That's the interoperability that Apple used when it reverse engineered Microsoft Office's file formats to make pages, numbers, and keynote. No one ordered Microsoft to give Apple the file spec, and Apple didn't ask Microsoft's permission to do that reverse engineering. Microsoft, in fact, did everything it could to make its file format as obscure as possible so that Apple and other companies could not copy it. Not only did they fail to cooperate with Apple, they actively opposed them. That interoperability, that is adversarial interoperability, or as we call it at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, competitive compatibility, or ComCom, because it's easier to say and it abbreviates better. ComCom is the story of every fallen tech monopolist and every new tech firm that ever rose to greatness. It is a impolite, no fucks given interoperability that doesn't care if when I plugged my thing into your thing, it made your shareholders sad. ComCom is central to the stories of everything from the IBM PC clones to the Hayes modem command set to Samba networking to the browser wars to the rise of the web and online uh, music. But a new global thicket of laws, laws that prohibit violating terms of service, laws that prohibit bypassing DRM, software patents, and more, has made this once routine and vital practice into a legal minefield that is only practiced in the shadows. So we need lawmakers and regulators to restore ComCom. We need to reform the existing laws so they can't be used to block ComCom. We need to establish new laws like an interoperator's defense that shields you from liability if you're engaged in legitimate interoperability, like making replacement parts or improving security or adding lawful features or making products or services accessible to people with disability. And by imposing conditions on companies that settle their antitrust lawsuits with regulators that ban them from attacking interoperators. Mandatory interoperability and adversarial interoperability are not exclusive. They're not contradictory. They're complementary. 
we want mandatory interoperability because it's orderly. If you read the documentation, you look at the reference code, you can build your app. And that's compared with the messy guerrilla warfare of ComCom, where you have to fuzz the inputs, find a flaw in the intrusion detection system, bypass the bootloader, and do it all again every time they patch or change their countermeasures. But we want ComCom because mandatory interoperability is brittle. Companies have endless ways to screw around and break mandatory interoperability. Like they can pretextually shut down your interface by calling it suspicious, or they can restructure their internal data model so that the fields that the API can access aren't useful anymore. When a company nerfs its mandatory API, getting it restored might involve a full-blown regulatory investigation, appeals, a judgment, and an order. But if ComCom is legally safe, if you're allowed to do the guerrilla warfare part instead of just coming through the front door that they're required to keep open for you, then the day that a dominant company breaks its API, all the little companies that rely on it can switch to ComCom. They can scrape, they can reverse engineer, they can do other adversarial stuff. In fact, companies are so frightened by that unquantifiable risk uh, that's posed by a free-for-all bot war that many of them will resist the temptation to wreck their APIs because the alternative is worse. And if they go for it, if they decide the hell with competition, we're going to roll the dice and see if we can get away from it, well then we get ComCom that fills the gap while we wait for a regulator to show up and smack them around and tell them to cut it out. So let me make that concrete because it's really abstract. In 2012, Massachusetts voters passed a ballot initiative that forced automakers to supply independent mechanics with, with uh, data they need to interpret diagnostic information that streams around the car's wired networks, what's called the CAN bus. Car makers had spent years systematically monopolizing independent car service, and the people of Massachusetts had had enough for it. Even before the Massachusetts law came into effect, car makers started redesigning their cars so that all the data that was needed for independent repair didn't go over that wire wired network. It went over a wireless network that they installed that the law didn't cover. It took eight more years before another ballot initiative was put before Massachusetts voters last year in 2020, updating the law and closing that loophole. And in the meantime, independent repair was widely suppressed, and many independent mechanics were forced to sell their businesses, go to work as employees for those car makers' authorized service centers. The mismatch between the time it takes to break a mandate and the time it takes to fix it is why we can't rely on mandates alone. For mandates to work, they need to have a counterweight, a consequence that befalls companies that subvert them, that hurts worse than obeying the mandate in the first place. And we get that counterweight through ComCom. Imagine if car makers had to worry about ComCom when they were subverting the repair mandate in Massachusetts. Imagine if when they switched their service messages from their car's wired networks to their car's wireless networks, a couple of smart MIT kids could have gone into business selling a $20 gadget that cost $1 for them to make that could grab the data from the car's wireless services. Anything the cars, car manufacturers did to freeze out those gadgets would mean retooling their authorized service centers and dealing with inevitable upgrade uh, problems from their own mechanics. Meanwhile, the independent mechanics would have a new business to supply them with diagnostic tools that MIT kids start up, and that business could offer other services to them, services that may, would make the automakers even less central to automotive repair. Like maybe they could become brokers for third-party parts. ComCom is the stiffener that turns otherwise structurally unsound mandates into sturdy, pro-competitive solutions. ComCom has plenty of opportunities for privacy abuse, of course. Today, companies say that they need anti-circumvention laws, enforceable terms of service, and anti-competitive laws to defend their users' privacy. But if we want to defend user privacy, we should do it with a privacy law, not an anti-hacking law, not a copyright law. Not by letting companies improvise highly selective privacy defenses from whatever legal tools they have lying around. With a privacy law, we could tell good ComCom from bad ComCom. Bad ComCom is ComCom that violates the privacy law. Good ComCom doesn't. After half a century of official tolerance for monopoly, the world is at a turning point. But the point of this fight isn't just about competition for its own sake. 
Every time a tech company like Apple introduces an anti-tracking technology, the ad tech industry says that it's anti-competitive. And they're right. Apple is making it hard to compete in the race to see who can affect the greatest number of human rights violations at the lowest cost. But... We don't want competition to see who's best at violating our human rights. We want to abolish human rights violations. Interop and privacy rules do more than enhance competition. They deliver something far nobler. They deliver technological self-determination. The right to decide how your tech works, to stick with a big company when it has your back, but to switch away when it doesn't. Because tech companies do have their users' backs. Sometimes, if a, if a platform knows that its users aren't afraid of switching costs, then it has incentives to treat those users well because otherwise they'll lose those users to better services. I'm not here to say that companies will always screw their users over. I know that some of you probably work for those big companies and you do hard, good work on behalf of them to defend stupid users like me who make dumb mistakes. But no one is ever going to pay is no, no one is ever going to pay you to defend me from your boss. Interop and privacy law are how we make it so that you don't have to. Thank you very much. And again, this talk was based on a paper that I co-wrote with my colleague at EFF, Bennett Ciphers, also called Privacy Without Monopoly, and you can download it at eff.org/pwm. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference.